This is the Hot Take Hockey Podcast with your hosts, Lucas and John Viveros. Hey everyone, it's John here from Hot Take Hockey, back with another podcast episode with the legend Lucas, episode 24. So the Hot Take Hockey Podcast, we're still rolling and we got two big guests on this episode. Uh, right off the bat, I'll just say thank you to Craig Button and David Alter, uh, the two guests for this episode. So we're packing it up. We're going two episodes in one, uh, two guests in one episode here. So uh, Lucas, man, are you excited for this episode? Fresh off of All-Star Weekend and of course, different news in the NHL. How are you doing? Buddy, man, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm so hyped to get back into it and to have two great guests come on, man. Like props out to Johnny V. He really, he really pushed this one and got the wheels in motion for both these guests. So I just want to give Johnny V his proper shouts there for that one. But I, I'm thrilled to talk to these guys. And uh, I mean, we got some big news right out of the gate. All-Star yeah. Weekend and also some some signings as well, John. So where do you want to start, man? Yeah, I guess we'll start with All-Star Weekend because it was the topic of conversation over the last couple of days. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I actually missed, so I didn't get to watch the All-Star comp live. So for me, a lot of the feedback uh, or a lot of my opinions, I should say, like will come from that feedback or what I saw online uh, or just myself watching the replays. Um, I, I will say off the bat, I think I obviously watching the games live, I think that for me was a bigger dub versus the comp. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll get your opinions in Lucas here, but um, yeah. to me, the comp, I just, the two things I didn't like were, I feel like the incentive or I feel like the effort or the pace from the game versus like what we saw in the comp. I just, I, I think fans were obviously disagreeing with that as well as, yeah, I think the, a lot of like the uh, like skits to me were just, I watched them back. I think they have the right idea. Cause you look at the NBA and we'll get into it about like the drafts and all this stuff personality especially from former players like kevin bx uh, pk suban they've been doing great but i feel like a lot of those skits were super forced i don't know how you feel about it yeah yeah i, I totally I, I totally can can see that i mean i'm in the same way as you john i'll be completely candid uh it was a busy friday and i didn't get to watch as much of the skills comp as i wanted to mm. um which is funny to say from somebody who probably should have consumed more of the weekend but i did see the full all-star game like you were saying and i i enjoyed enjoyed the skill that was being put on i think overall like we always got to peel back and remember it is for kids um and it's hard like for me to remember you know what my kid brain would be thinking if i would really you know enjoy the way the events being put on now yeah. um there are times where like I do see how it could be perceived as cringy or just a little bit forced. And so, you know, those are all things that uh, the league's going to have to work out in future, future uh, all-star games. And I think we're going to, we're going to do that, but um, you know, overall it was a success in Florida. Um, I think the market, it was good to see that market get an all-star game. I think it would have been nice to maybe see some more people in the seats as well. Uh, yeah. I think that was some feedback that we saw and, and, and certainly that's something that, we'll hopefully see uh, next season in Toronto. Um, but yeah, I mean, those are my initial thoughts, but I think it was cool to see. It's always cool to see the, you know, Crosby and Ovechkin, that era blending with, you know, the McDavid's and the dry Seidel's and, and even the younger than that, right. Suzuki and, and Larkin, that sort of age, you know, playing with these guys. Um, that's my long winded spiel on yeah. my initial thoughts of it, John, but uh, you know, overall a, a dub, right. Overall. Yeah, and I was going to say, I know you're coming from the NHL side and yeah. like coordinating sponsors and coordinating so, so many different things, especially in like, I, I don't want to call it a non-hockey market, but definitely a decreased hockey market in Florida. So you're really in different aspects trying, I would say, overcompensating to to make it work. Um, mm -hmm. I think Toronto in a lot of aspects will be easier. I don't think it necessarily um, eliminates these other issues that, I mean, will just come regardless of the market. Uh, but I do think Toronto brings, I would say, a much more easy path here to, to bring a successful uh, weekend versus I think if you look at it and you talk to the players, I think the vacation and the weather aspect for Florida is probably the biggest up if you talk to players. Yeah, like, man. That aspect. <laughs> yeah. And Elliot was even talking about it on 32 Thoughts, his, his recent pod there, just dropping that a lot of the players, they love these events being in warm spots. Um, So it'll be a big contrast being in Toronto, but obviously Toronto's the hockey mecca, like you're saying. Yeah. So I think that... That brings a lot of excitement. I think another challenge that the league, you know, was was dealing with is that you know a lot of the beach, like the beach photographs and the beach party, all those sorts of events, were half an hour from the arena. So that's also another logistical challenge. It'll be interesting to see where they do these sort of events uh, in Toronto next year. But I'm stoked for it being in Toronto, man. I mean, I don't remember the last time it was in Toronto being in 2000. Um, I would have been two and a half years old, so I can't really recall that one, Johnny. I know you would have been about six months. 
or roughly around there. Yeah. So uh, uh, I'm stoked to see the, the, the next iteration in Toronto next year. Yeah. I think overall they have so much potential with it. Um, I, I think the one thing that, yeah, you just brought 32 thoughts yeah. and I was listening. It was like pulling from the NBA and actually we talked about this on a, a previous pod, like a few weeks ago before the all-star weekend even happened. I was saying like, you got to pull from the NBA on a couple of these things. And one is the live draft or some kind of draft segment. I mean, I, I can only just imagine Crosby and Ovi or Crosby and McDavid picking at all-stars left and right. And, and I know Elliot brought it up as like no player or actually maybe it was Merrick. No player wants to go last in this draft and be mm-hmm. like the Phil Kessel meme. Uh, but that also just, man, it happens. Like it's part of the fun, man. It's part of the fun. It's part of the sport. NHL drafts. Like we're not eliminating like these seventh round picks. Like guys get drafted last all the time. So sure, Kessel meme still a thing, but it also brings more exposure to hockey. So I yeah, think the draft's got to be a thing. And also incorporating some like, you know what, Fall Out Boy, I, I think was a dub for a lot of people. But now you're coming to Toronto where it's like Justin Bieber's right in your face. I know some people will talk about the Drake curse, but you have opportunities here to bring real freaking top notch artists to the table. I think Bieber will be an easy grab. I mean, he also I think, already man, made the video, right? Yeah, yeah, I did see that video. And I think if I, this, I just, just popped in my head right now, but I think Drake performed at the All-Star game that was in Ottawa uh, about a decade ago. So that was an interesting collab there. I'll, I'll have to go rewatch it, but I'm like 99% sure on that one. I'll, I'll send you the vid after. I'm, but that was an exciting one. Bieber's right there. Um, the opportunities are there, like you said. But to give you, to go back to your comments about the draft, John, man, my brother and I this weekend, we sat down because we had nothing to do on Sunday and we watched the draft from 2011 uh, and just yeah. seeing like the excitement of that. Duffy, obviously, shout out yeah. to James Duffy. He he obviously uh, hosted it and it was awesome, man. Like that's the type of uh, excitement that I want um, to be in the All-Star game. So that would be cool to see on, on the Friday. And I know Elliot was was talking about that, like you like you said. Yeah, and, and this is more so me joking here, but maybe like they were in Florida and now you're coming to Toronto. Maybe just like, you got to get the boys rolling with like, whether it's Bieber, whoever free like competition, get a couple beer skis in them and just let them loose. No, no four skits, let them loose or something. Yeah, <laughs> I was man. joking, but <laughs> I, I, I do want to see like something that's less force. I, I know it's, it's got to be organized to an extent, but um, man, I want to see them bring out the stops in Toronto. I think it's going to be, sometimes it's tough even more so to be relaxed because the media scene and like the fans in Toronto, like you can be more relaxed in Florida. Uh, so that's another aspect of it being organized. So I'm excited, man. The fact that it's going to be in Toronto, I, I'm really interested to see how they're going to do it. Cause it's going to be a, a complete 180 from the Florida environment. So yeah, man, in, in a lot of different ways. So we'll definitely see um, all-star weekend. So as we just said, happened and we saw a little bit of a different situation we've never seen before. So Bo Horvat and an Islanders and a fisherman Jersey, uh, but still repping the Pacific division with Pedersen. Uh, what do you think about the Horvat situation, uh, the contract extension, Lucas, and then Lou Lamorello saying, what was the quote? It was too much money, too long. Too many years, too or... many years, too much money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> uh, well, first off, I mean, with the All-Star game, I think it was handled properly. Like, you need to have the Islanders emblem on him. He's now an official Islander. But to move him over to the Metro, like we discussed last week, it would have caused too many complications. So I think keeping yeah. him on the Pacific was the right move. I mean, it was cool seeing him link up with Pedersen. Uh, one last time, right? I mean, Canucks fans probably having their their heart pulled uh, on strings there, but you know it was cool. It was cool to see, uh, and then the contract obviously unbelievable. I always think it's unbelievable when a player signs a contract after being dealt to them and hasn't even stepped foot on the ice yet. I think it's crazy because it's just like Horvat hasn't seen the fit necessarily yet, um, but uh, but I think he he sees the promise in the Islanders, and I yeah. think the, the Islanders were on his you know, top five teams that he wanted to go to. Right. So um, it was cool to see that come together really fast. And obviously Vancouver didn't offer him that deal, right. That eight and a half by eight. Yeah. Um, I think it was always under eight or in yeah. eight. So they went a yeah. little higher to get it done. Yeah. And then Lou Lamorello was just beautiful. Like just that, that's so Lou man, but he's signing a lot of big deals right now. Like if, yeah. if you look at the deals, this guy's signing, <laughs> he ain't going to be around to deal with them when it gets hard. Um, oh no, he's brought. I, I saw some kind of tweet where it was like, "Yeah, like Andrews Lee will be at his current cap hit at 35, like Paul Mary at 35, Pajot at 35, Zizekas 30, Horvat 34." Yeah, roughly, like so. Like, so you're gonna have a lot of contracts. 
still there at these late or mid to late thirties. So yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. The Islanders, Lou is, and yeah, maybe it's an age thing as we talked about. He's, he's very much in the now, not six, seven years from now. So, <laughs> But, um, but overall, right now, I think they do have, like we talked about last week, we'll quickly just touch on it. I think the Islanders got a solid top six, um, and hopefully this helps them you know, get on a bit of a roll here because they're going to need to you know, rhyme off some wins fast to get back into relevance here to make the playoffs because at this point, it's playoffs or bust, man. They got to make the playoffs. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of teams that are in that in-between stage, and the Islanders have made it clear which direction they want to go. Uh, just, yeah, a couple other things, guys, uh, Jace, uh, Jason, Jacob Magna got traded from the sharks to the Seattle Kraken for a conditional fourth. Yeah. Lucas, I don't know if we want to go over this too much. Go watch my video guys on hot take yeah. hockey. Uh, YouTube. check out Johnny's video. Yeah. I, to me, I kind of went over everything big yeah. size, big addition to an already big defense core in Seattle. Uh, Seattle just gets tougher to play against and, uh, improves their penalty kill a little bit. So that's kind of the gist of that. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Lucas, do you wanted to touch on just the capitals contracts? Yeah. We'll speak of teams that are kind of floating in and out of the playoff bubble. There's Washington who's for me, at least they've surprised me and that they're, they're right there to, to, to make the playoffs again. Um, and they've locked up Sonny Milano and Dylan Strom. Sonny Milano gets three years, 1.9 a year. And that's a very interesting one because he obviously went into Calgary on a PTO. Yeah. Um, and his career was looking like it was in jeopardy for a while there. Um, but he's found a nice home there in, in Washington, which is good to see. And then Dylan Strom, speaking of finding a nice home, he gets five by five. Um, Johnny, what do you think of these deals? Well, J- Dylan Strom is probably the bigger one um, to yeah. touch on. I think Milano, good for him, yep. uh, took advantage of the opportunity. But I'm going to say more so Dylan Strom because there was a lot of conversations of like Dylan Strom to like a Toronto or like a Canadian team, like bigger market um, at one point. But I think Dylan Strom, kind of like Max Domi, looked at an opportunity here and said, oh, Nick Backstrom's hurt. I can get first or second line ice time, a lot of good ice time, and earn a contract. That's kind of what Max Domi did. I mean, he went to Chicago yeah. and went on the top line, gets to play with Patty Kane, stuff like that. So Dylan Strom, smart call. He was never going to get that with other teams. The only contract uh, or the only team you'd get a contract like that really was Washington because they had the injuries and they were able to make the space for it. So, um, yeah, Dylan Strom, I think it's a good fit with Washington, especially as Backstrom is going to be done here. Uh They'll have uh, they'll have that uh, spot filled, and Dylan Strom could be the guy who gives Ovi his uh, you know Gretzky pass and goal one day. You never know, man. This yeah, might be part know. of the plan for him, right? Five years locking up there, part of history. <laughs> he's gonna be there for part of history. It just depends if he's on the ice or not. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, we covered the stuff that's been happening lately. So hopefully, uh, you guys, I appreciate you guys listening. Um, we appreciate uh, just the feedback as well. And now that we're bringing on two guests on one podcast, uh, suggest some more guests coming up. But we got a legend coming up, Lucas. Craig Button on the pod. And then we got David Alter as well coming on. Uh, Lucas, what do you think, man? We're, we're both Let's do it, guests. buddy. Let's keep let's her going. Let's do it, man. The show is rolling. It's rocking and rolling. Guests are coming. I mean, let's do it. Let's Let's speak to our boy, Craig Button. All right. Let's get Craig Button on the podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hot Take Hockey Podcast. We got a legend on the show for this one. We got Craig Button, TSN Director of Scouting. Uh, You'll know him through scouting, analyst appearances on TSN. Uh, Craig, thank you so much for joining the show today. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing really well. Yeah, glad to join you guys. Uh, You know, it's hard to believe we're into February now and we talk about the draft, we talk about the playoffs. It's, It's an interesting time and we arrive here and you kind of go, how did we get here so fast? But maybe we didn't. <laughs> yeah. Time just in general in life just yeah. seems to continue to fly by. Um, yeah. Hockey season, man, just past the all-star weekend uh, into that conversation of, as you said, draft, but more so in, over the next month, the trade deadline. Uh, so Craig, we really appreciate your time and coming on uh, just for you right now is this kind of time period for, as we just said, all-star, but more so for you as uh, focusing on scouting, what's kind of your day-to-day or week-to-week looking like? Are you attending a lot of games? Like I'll say for myself right now, I actually saw you a few years ago. It was pre-COVID. Uh, my brother used to play on the Halton Hurricanes and it was against the, uh, uh, the was it Little Caesar, I, Caesar, I guess? Yeah, uh, Luke Hughes was on the team. So it was OHL Cup, I believe. Uh, but I saw you in the building. So is that kind of how you go week-to-week leading into the draft? You're going to a lot of games or, or what's kind of your schedule looking like in that aspect? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm involved in lots of different things. I mean, I have a lot of variety in, in the work that I do. So, you know, when I when I find those opportunities to get into the arenas, like 
for an example, on the uh, just trying to think here, the 19th and the 20th, I thought Sudbury's playing in uh, Niagara and Peterborough on a Sunday, Monday. So, you know, you know, Quentin Musty is uh, a player that's very interesting for the coming draft, and yeah. he's coming off of, of an injury, so he's returning to play. And so, you know, that's an opportunity to uh, go and see him on back-to-back days. Uh, you know, I'm, I'll be doing work in the studio. I think we're doing a CHL game on the Friday, uh, Sarnia in London, and Saturday I'll be doing uh, some uh, TSN analyst work as well as Sunday night. So you try to, I try to work in the, the the scouting where I can, and you know, obviously it has to be a priority, but it it, it dovetails with with a lot of the different things that I'm doing, and uh, you know, in the next in the next just about over three weeks, the trade deadline is going to take on a lot of focus, but you can't lose sight of the other things on the on the schedule, yeah. or or you'll lose track, and and at this time of the year, losing track is something you can't afford to do. Yeah, absolutely, Craig. Well, what, uh, appreciate you coming on and bouncing between the amateur level and the pro level as well. Um, obviously, Bo Horvat with just signing that deal with with the Islanders. I, I saw your initial reaction to the trade. What's your reaction to uh, to the signing with the eight and a half by eight that that Lou Lamorello handed out? Well, you, you know, I, I said at the time I'd be shocked if Lou doesn't sign into a long term yep. contract because you don't just pick up the phone and make a trade without without having some understanding. Uh, I shouldn't say some understand without having a real thorough understanding uh, of what it's going to take to sign him. I mean, those aren't deals you're just going to go make to that magnitude unless you know you can, you have reasonable, a really reasonable chance to sign him. I I think the most interesting thing about the contract is there's no signing bonuses attached Mm -hmm. to it. And, and, and that becomes significant. And people go, what do you mean? No signing bonuses. Well, you know, we've seen, uh, the vast, ma- I should say vast majority, but we've seen a lot of contracts with players that have had the vast amount of the contract uh, enveloped in, in signing bonuses. And, and why is that? It's because it's buyout proof. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, to me, I think Lou, who's been around and, and, and had a lot of success over a lot of years, you know, to me, like if you're signing a contract at this point in time and you're saying, hey, you know what? OK, we'll meet that number, but there's no signing bonuses. Because you know what, at 28, you're getting your term. But at, if, if he turns 34 and he can't, I want the opportunity to buy him out. I want the opportunity to save some money. He'll still get a, a portion of money, but we're not going to keep paying, you know, if, if, if he can't perform at, at, at a requisite level. And obviously, you're not asking a player to perform at the same level, 34, 35, that he does at 28, yeah. 29, 30. But I think that that was very interesting. And I, I think from a management point of view, that's something that should be emphasized, you know. Mm-hmm. It's different when a player's younger, you know, maybe coming out of entry level. You know you got it. You're not – I mean, that player, uh, you know, falling off in his production it, isn't something that, you, you know, you, you can really uh, foreshadow because it's not something that happens. But when you're 28, I would say, no, you're not getting signing bonus. So Lou has the opportunity to help his team now. He also has the opportunity uh, as, as as the years progress for Bo – uh, to see where he's producing, and, and if he doesn't produce at a level, you know you can uh, you can mitigate some of that cost uh, by buying out the player. So I thought that was really uh, a, a really good functional part of this deal. Is that the way the contract was structured? But Bo Horvat's a good player, and you, you know the uh, New York Islanders don't have a player like that. They simply don't. And you know you, you it also not only what he adds, it also lessens the burden on Brock Nelson. Matt Barzell, you know, on, 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 on Lee. players, on yeah. Lee, all those yeah. players that are there. So, so, so you've added another offensive weapon. You've lessened the burden on them. You've given Lane Lambert an opportunity to, to maneuver his lineup. And I'm talking about in game in a really significant manner that doesn't handcuff them and, and doesn't limit it as other players. And I think that that becomes significant for the Islanders. They got an excellent goaltender in Sorokin. They got an excellent blue line. They have a really good team that plays excellent defense. Their their problem, their challenge has been not enough offense. And I think Bo will really help in that regard. Yeah, I think even as you said, I think Horvat also just fits their style. I think the yeah. the scoring with the style of play of, of the Islanders. So I think adding that that threat up front and We'll see what kind of look it brings with Barzal in the wing now, because obviously mm-hmm. we know the chemistry with Bailey's there in the past, but uh, 
from the center spot, not from the wing spot. So we'll see how Barzell fits in that way. But Craig, on the other side, the Canucks, and I feel like just more recently, we've been talking about the Canadian teams and obviously every year it's Toronto in the playoffs, Edmonton in the playoffs, all these conversations. So what's your stance on obviously that whole Canucks situation, but Canadian teams as a whole, are you confident we could see a cup finally come back to Canada in the next couple of years? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, the league is such that, I mean, you look around the league and you, and, and you see how many good teams there are. You know, it, I mean, I, 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 my own personal feeling is, is that like, you know, every city wants to win. And, and it's obviously in Canada, you, you know, you have seven NHL teams and the fan base is passionate and they want to see their team win. But, you know, the, 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 you, we, we look back and we go, oh, since 1993, the last time a Canadian team won. Well, there, there's been a lot of things that have unfolded since 1993. The economics of the league, CBAs, you know, and, and, and really, I go back to 2005. You know, that's really when the new CBA, the, the, the salary cap came in, structure of the league with terms of interference and, and letting the skill kind of rise to the top, I think became really significant. So that's when I go back. You know, there's been Canadian teams in the final. I mean, in 06, there was a team in the final. And even right before the lockout, in 04, there was a Canadian team in the final. We know in 2011, there was a Canadian team in the final. You know, so, you know, I I, I don't get so fussed about, because there's lots of good Canadian players yeah. winning Stanley Cups outside of Canada. Yeah. So I don't think it's a reflection on Canada. I just think that, you know, at, 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 at times you, you, you see teams that run through these cycles. And, you know, even when you look at the Montreal Canadiens going to the Stanley Cup final in 21, it was a mirage. It was a total mirage. Would it have been nice to see them win? I think for Montreal Canadiens fans, yes, but it was a mirage. And you, you ride that wave and you love riding that wave. But I think when you look at the Winnipeg Jets this year, who have had a really solid season, the Toronto Maple Leafs continue to have solid regular seasons. So, I mean, th th these are teams that are in the hunt. Calgary, you know, has had a little bit of a fall off. Edmonton, you know, you look at all their talent. I don't think there's any question that, you know, depending on what happens here in the next three and a half weeks for both Edmonton and Calgary, can, can really be significant in their fortunes going forward and competing for a cup. You know, at the beginning of the season – I thought the Calgary Flames had a great chance to win the cup. In fact, I picked them to win the cup. But, you know, their season hasn't unfolded the way they would have liked. The Toronto Maple Leafs, despite all their regular season success, teams or people are going, well, what are they going to do? Do they need to do things? I think they do need to do things. But you got you got four pretty good teams in Canada now. It, you know, for, for a stretch of time, there, there was only a couple of teams in Canada. At least now, I think that the odds – have been pushed a little bit higher with more teams having ha having the opportunity to be in that conversation, you know, with respect to competing for a Stanley Cup. Because the teams are good, they are better, but there's yeah. there's a lot of good teams in this league. It's not easy to win. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, with all the Canadian teams right now, I'm finding even the ones that are trending near the bottom of the league, Craig, I feel like when you look at a team like Montreal, a team like Ottawa, they're really building something there with the nucleus of players they have where I see sort of a bright future for those teams, you know, with Suzuki and Caulfield and with Montreal trending downward into the Bedard sweepstakes, as, as well as Ottawa with Stutzla, Batherson, Norris, all those guys. So, uh, it, yeah, it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on, on those Canadian teams. But as far as I wanted to pick your brain with, you know, what some of these playoff contenders need to do, like the Maple Leafs. Um, you know, is it a, a big it's forward? It's the question every year. <laughs> yeah. Is it a big forward in the top six, Craig, that's actually an impact forward, unlike a, you know, a Nick Felino ad that they did a few years back? Is it blue line depth? Is it both? Uh, how do you feel about the goaltending? Let, let's start with the Leafs. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think when they traded for Nick Felino, I thought that was a really good, strong move to, to give you, uh, you know, a, a type of player, a type, a style of play that I think is, I don't think, is shown to be very successful come playoff time. The challenge for Nick was he wasn't healthy, and that became a, a problem for the Toronto Maple Leafs. You know, when I, when, you know, I, I've said this a number of times now, and I'll continue to say it. You know, the Tampa Bay Lightning won 62 games in the 2018-19 season, and they got railroaded pretty quick. Uh, come uh, come to playoffs, that four game loss forced yeah. in, in, in to Columbus. They had Kucherov, they had Braden Point, they had lots of talent, and Julian Julian Brisebois recognized that they needed 
different they needed to add different players they needed to add different types of players he wasn't concerned about their skill but he knew deeper down the lineup so you, you know he examined it they come to the what what ends up happening in that 1920 season and and, and you know with the pause people weren't sure how that was going to play out but it ultimately played out they trade for Blake Coleman they trade for Barkley Goodrow those became really significant trades because it added to Yanni Gord. They weren't concerned about their top end. They were concerned about adding players that would make you harder to play against deeper into the lineup. And I think that's where the Toronto Maple Leafs find themselves. You know, they, you know, just talk about, hey, listen, you know, you know, we've earned the respect of the Tampa Bay Lightning. Okay, that's great. Well, now what you have to do is just follow the Tampa Bay Lightning template. You know, I don't think, I don't think it's so much about star quality as about quality type of player like go get a Blake Coleman go get a Barkley Goodrow go get a a Brandon Hagel go those types of players I think uh, could really help the Toronto Maple Leafs at this point in time when I watch the Toronto Maple Leafs play I think that you talk about I think they can use a winger with some size and some speed up front and I, de- I think they could use a, a third line center and obviously they can use a defenseman you know because of because of Muzzin's injury yeah. Now, can you do all those things? Probably not. Mm-hmm. You know, it takes a lot of uh, salary cap uh, gymnastics to be able to pull some of those things off. But how do you strengthen your team? You know exactly who you're playing in the first round. Yeah. You, you know do. exactly who you're going to play if you win the first round. So, I mean, if 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 it, if it isn't as clear as clear as possibly can be, I don't know when it'll ever be that way. So, and, and you don't have to improve your team to this great, magnificent extent. You just got to make your team a little bit harder to play against. I go back to Tampa Bay and I go back to Colorado last year because they won the cup and the and two cups and then the one last year by Colorado, their first. So they trade for Josh Manson. Terrific trade. Takes the pressure off of Eric Johnson. Now Taze and McCarr, sent, like those players can go do their thing. Then they go and trade Brandon Cogliano. They add a they add a a quick player, a fast player that gives a, you know a lineup a, like more more challenges for an opponent. Then mm-hmm. they trade for Arturi Lekkinen, a, a versatile forward. They complain a lot. They didn't. They they had Gabriel Landeskog. They had Rantanen. They had size. They had areas of their team covered off. They didn't need to to go. They had Burakovsky. They didn't need to go and. Have, but they added areas that made their team stronger. And you can look at it and go, well, Manson and Cogliano and Lekunen, that's making your team harder to play against. That's making your team deeper. To me, that's what the Toronto Maple Leafs have to do. You know, a a number of years ago, I said Miles Wood would be an ideal player for the Toronto Maple Leafs. You know, that I mean, I I don't see the New Jersey Devils trading him because he's an important player for them now. But there's players like that that – with size, with weight, with speed, that can give your team more advantages. You know, Nick Paul last year, you know, not, 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 not a big, significant name, but he became an incredibly important player for the Tampa Bay Lightning. And and, and so it, it just adds, it just adds, it strengthens your team. So I think that's where the Leafs have to look. Now, there, there, there might only be an opportunity to add a defense. There might be only an opportunity to add a third-line center. But – where are those opportunities? Because it is it like I don't know if it ever gets clearer than this for the Toronto Maple Leafs in terms of what their path is. Yeah, for sure. And I, I like what you said about the the depth and the third lines because yeah, Colorado, you talked about it, Tampa, but even like a Pittsburgh, like the HBK line winning. I mean, in a lot of ways, that won Pittsburgh the cup. I feel like a lot of playoff teams or all playoff teams have that star quality, that top notch star quality, but you have that depth to win you rounds, not just make the playoff appearance, get that um, participation medal. So yeah, I mean, with the Leafs, uh, Craig, I, I like what you said also with um, the type of players, because yeah, the Felino one didn't work, but that's why people try to throw like Lawson Kraus in the equation or like a bunch of different guys like that. There's six, three, six, four that can put in the back of the net. Um, and obviously Colorado, the names you said, even a guy like Nichushkin they brought in. Um, also what you said about the Leafs already know their opponent. And it was kind of a conversation with Crosby's quote, um, Crosby uh, answering a question about the one uh, to eight format. What's your opinion on the the playoff format right now? Uh, are you guys basketball fans? Yeah, I, I'd say I'm a decent NBA guy. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Do you like March Madness? Yeah, absolutely. Of course. March Madness is pretty exciting, right? So yeah, you know they had the, they had the selection day on the Sunday, and then they bracket everybody, right? Yep. 
Do, do the second and third seeds play in the second round of the regionals? No, no. Never. No, nope. never. Because the NCAA, and this is tournament play, and the NFL playoffs are exactly the same. You want an opportunity for your best teams to be able to play come semifinal, come Stanley Cup final time. And the NHL doesn't do it. And it's to me, it's wrong. To me, Sidney Crosby has it bang on correct. You know what? One versus eight, two versus seven. I don't I don't I don't need receding. The NCAA doesn't do receding. I don't need receding. But you know what? I don't like the fact, and all I gotta do is, is look and, and it's happened in other you just look at this year. You look at this year with the fact that the Toronto Maple Leafs, three of the best teams in the NHL, Toronto, Tampa Bay, and Boston, two of them are guaranteed. At the very least, two are guaranteed to be gone by the end of the second round. Mm -hmm. So you potentially want your biggest market, one of your top teams in the league, gone by the end of the second round at the latest. You want a team that has the notoriety of the Tampa Bay Lightning, maybe gone after the first round, maybe, no, but no, like, like maybe after the second. The Boston Bruins are big market. It makes no, and people talk, oh, the Smite division back in the nine, in the 80s was great. Yeah, okay, it was great. So you had the five best teams in the league, or three of the five best teams or six best teams in the league at that time were Edmonton, Calgary, and Winnipeg. So you were eliminating two of the best five, six teams in the league back then. It wasn't a good idea back then either. I don't care that the Battle of Alberta and Calgary and Edmonton were so good. And I want my best teams playing deeper into the playoffs. And I want the regular season to matter. I want the top teams to be rewarded, you know, with a great regular season by playing a lower seed. I don't want the Boston Bruins to have to go and have to face the winner of Tampa Bay, uh, Toronto. I don't want the Tampa Bay Lightning and the Toronto Maple Leafs who could be top four teams in the league, one of them being eliminated in the first round. I don't want it. I think it's bad. And I don't buy – like, and and, and there, there's no way that anybody can tell me and make a case for, well, you know what, it creates division rivalries. It's not about division rivalries. It's about having your best teams continue to play deeper in the playoffs. The NCAA, mm -hmm. March Madness, doesn't do it. I think it's madness that the NHL does not have the same seeding system. Well, and we were talking about before you came on, Craig, that with the NBA, you brought up the, that conversation is like, it's not even just the playoff format. It's like even the all-star weekend or certain things, whether um, it's bringing fans in or marketing your players. Yeah. You want, you want the Boston Bruins versus the Toronto Maple Leafs in the Eastern conference final. You want the Washington Capitals versus the Pittsburgh Penguins in the Eastern conference final. You don't want that to be done in the first round. Um, and that kind of goes back to the all-star conversation is like, whether it's a draft or whether it's, um, I don't know, better competitions, whatever it is. It's just, I feel like the NHL has tried um, to, yeah, create rivalries or create storylines, um, but also has eliminated other aspects. Like you said, the the best teams in the in the final moment. So, um, yeah, to me, it's been really tough. I, obviously, coming from a Leaf perspective, I think that's maybe a bias on, on the, uh, from maybe my point of view on, on the format, but um, just overall, I, I'm with you. I think you want the best teams. To John, be John, as well. I feel like it does limit, you know, f some storylines that we don't get. You know, as a Leaf, from a Leaf perspective, you're going to see the Leafs never really play Sidney Crosby and the Penguins. Um, you're never going to get to see that opportunity. Obviously, we saw the Leafs uh, play Washington that one year, but that was almost off of fluke because of the wild card scenario, right? Where right now, it seems like the only path for the Leafs getting forward is through Boston, Boston and Tampa, Tampa, like yeah, you said, ever, Craig. Yeah. So, yeah, it totally makes sense. Um, well, Lucas, you make a point there, too, that's really yeah. good. What opportunities are we missing? What opportunities yeah. are being missed by this? Yeah. You know, Ovechkin, you know, a young Toronto Maple Leafs team is in the playoffs, and Ovechkin comes into the biggest hockey market on the planet. Yeah. Like, seriously, that's mm -hmm. not good for hockey? Give me a break. Exactly. Great for hockey. That Crosby and Scotiabank Arena, Game 7. Oh, huh. The Crosby and Montreal playing against one another? You, you, yeah, you kidding me? Be nuts. It, it'd be awesome. It's unbelievable. You know, can you imagine Boston playing Detroit in a in a, in a playoff series? You, you know, like I mean, it can happen because Detroit and them are in the same conference. But like Boston playing the Rangers, it'd be it'd be unbelievable. unbelievable. Thankfully, Colorado and Edmonton are not in the same division because I I like the fact that we can get another opportunity of a McDavid versus McKinnon and hopefully a longer series this time in the conference final. Yeah, um, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, see, but 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 again, you know, like you, you, you get these, like you don't know what's going to happen. Like all of a sudden, McKinnon and McDavid, wow, how exciting is that? Like these are the things that you get that are born out of you know things that 
you know, yeah, you can have division rivalries. Well, if you keep just having it set up division, but what else are you going to have? It's the only thing you're going to have is division rivalries. Yeah. And you miss out on some other bigger, but potentially Colorado-Detroit back in the day was a great rivalry. It was a great rivalry. No, but they're not in the same division anymore, Craig, so they won't play. (laughs) They they were never in the same division. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, Craig, what are your thoughts also going further on that, a 1-16? to Or is that just the travel you think is, is too much to bear? Like similar yeah. to yeah yeah I I I think one to eight is the is the step to take that's the like sweet I, spot I think one to sixteen I I think you could potentially hurt now your top teams mm-hmm. by having them have to go through travel that is unanticipated yeah you know when you when you look at the west and the east and you know you try to consider uh you know like for an example like you you, you know what happens if you know Vancouver you know, ends up being a 16 seed and they got to go and and Boston's got to go play Vancouver. Like, wow. Or to your point, you know, Florida who won last year, the president's trophy, Vancouver sneaks in as a 16 seed. That's not an advantage. I don't, I don't like that. That's, Mm -hmm. that's where the geography comes into play and you know, move it from there. So it sounds like the majority, yeah, the majority of feedback I'm hearing, even, even through fans and such that I've spoken to is like the one to eight, and then also eliminate the obviously the division winner because I think that division winner coming, you know, so you win the Atlantic, but you have less points than second place in the Metro. You shouldn't be above them in the standings. It should be one to eight in the East, um, you know, one, eight, two, seven, and such like that. Yeah, you know, it would depend on how you formulate your divisional play. Yeah. You know, I, I have no problem. I mean, I think there's different uh, aspects that you can look at and, the, the aspect that, that, that you uh, uh, think would be good. I mean, that, depending on how the regular season schedule works out, but I have no problem that, you, you, you know, if you can work it, okay, you win your division, that's the first reward. You know, mm-hmm. I have no problem with that, you know, but I mean, I, I, I think the biggest thing is, and it, it, is this the discussion around ensuring that you have your best teams playing deeper into the playoffs. Yep. Um, just on the playoff conversation, Craig. I don't know. Well, actually, I have a draft con- conversation too, but yeah, sure. they kind of they kind of tie in. So, sleeper team or sleeper prospect? I don't know if you want to take these two into one answer here, but uh, do you have a sleeper team for the playoffs that maybe no one's talking about? And then I also wanted to jump to: Do you have a sleeper prospect that you've been keeping an eye on that maybe no one's talking about? Yeah, well, I can only tell you this. Let me answer the prospect question first. Uh, like, like first of all, I'm projecting the draft for who I think will be the best players in whatever three to five years time, you know, yeah. pick, pick whatever your time frame is. If I think a player's got a chance to be really good, he, 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 he's not hiding somewhere in my third round. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he He's right up there. Right. So, I mean, I've always done that. That's what I do. So I can ask that question a lot, John, about, uh, you know, sleepers. And I go, just look at my list and, you know, compare it to your own list or whatever. Those well, yeah. Are- I guess where I was going at is like, do you have a guy higher that maybe, other colleagues well, or scouts I don't, don't have high. Yeah, like I, I mean, a lot of times I don't know because you know, like you know, I spend a lot of time in the ranks. I spend a lot of time, you know, talking to different people, hearing. I get questioned, why do you have that guy so high, and yeah. you know, different things, or why do you have that guy so low, and so I get all those questions. So you know, high, low always to me become: do I have somebody that's too high or too low? You know, I, I'm trying to look at. I mean, on average, I can only tell you, th- this is fact. And and you know and, and I'm I'm losing approximately forty players from this draft will play three hundred to three hundred twenty five games in the NHL. Wow, 40. Mm-hmm. forty, approximately forty. That's what you're getting. So like you know what? Like there's seven rounds times thirty two teams, That's right? So you're trying to sit down and you try to sit down. And you're trying to figure out. Okay, I can guarantee you guys right now, everybody on the planet can figure out and say these twenty guys are first round picks. You, you can nail 21st. Everybody on the planet can. But now after that, who and, and some of those 20 are not going to pan out. But then after that, who who are the players that you think can be? And and w- w- what is it usually the case of? A player that might not be big. A player that might have to improve his skating. A la Jason Robertson. You know, size, Braden Point. Right? Like, you know, those those are the guys that emerge, right? And so you're always trying to look at that and trying to say, okay, you know, where does this guy fit in and at the same time? But, you know, I, I don't know if there's a sleeper, 
you know, that comes in, you know, like I, I, I look at players and I just think that like, okay, what's your thinking? What's your, what, what, you know, you need a certain level of skill, but what's your thinking? What's your competitive level? You got to be able to skate. You got to have skill. And that goes, what's your thinking? What's your competitive? And how, and, and, and how do you manage the different challenges that come your way? I'm not worried about size when I see a player who might not be strong enough to hold his own, but is willing to hold his own. He might get knocked down and pushed around, but you're going, wait a sec, when he's 21, he's not going to get pushed around. He's going to be like, you know, and I hear that a lot and I've heard that for years. Oh, well, he can't win that battle. Today he can't, but he's in it. And I see a lot of big guys that don't get into the battle. And, you know, those are the guys that I worry about. So, you know, when, when I look at the draft, I think there's a lot of good players. The player that, that, that I, that I have a real affinity for in this year's draft that I think is terrific. And I think that he's got a chance to be a really, really good player is Tommy V Lander, the defenseman from Sweden. I think he's fantastic. I've seen him play a dozen times. Every time I see him, I leave liking him more because I think that he's got so many qualities that I think translate to the NHL. I'm prepared to be wrong. But that's the guy that I think is has got a tremendous amount of ability. And without looking at my list, I'm pretty sure I had him in the top half of uh, like I think I had him in my top 16 somewhere. He might have been 14 or 15 somewhere in there. I don't have it right in front of me, but I know I love the kid. Uh, and do you have a and do you have a team right now going to the playoffs that? Might be that maybe not necessarily the Blues last place and then make the run and win the cup, but maybe something along those lines. <laughs> well, I'm going to eliminate Colorado only because they've had so many injuries. Yeah, and I think that you know once you once you get through that, once you get past that, you know if they can get those injured players back, I think they become a real formidable team. Uh, you know, there's two teams I'm really keeping my eye on: Carolina Hurricanes. Because I think I don't think they they've been a good team for a number of years now. New Jersey's a good team. I I think they're going to have to start to go through some of those experiences of being in the playoffs. How hard it is! Mm-hmm. Everybody can tell you how hard the playoffs are, but until you start experiencing it, you don't realize. And I I think they need to go through that to to get to a point in time where they can be in that spot. Carolina, I think, is there. They made significant moves. Brett Burns, Max Pacioretty, who they've lost but they got room to do some things. They're the one team that I'm really paying attention to. The other team is the Winnipeg Jets. I think the Winnipeg Jets have a really good team. They have a top-notch goaltender uh, up front. They're big, they're strong, they're skilled. It'll be interesting to see what Kevin Dayoff does here at the deadline. But I think that's the team that I wouldn't be sleeping on. And, you know, not as they currently are. I think they have to add some things. And I think that when you look at the trade deadline and you look at the playoffs, Kevin Dayoff has seen a team that he believed in perform at a level that he believed they could be in. Now it's up to him. To me, he's on the clock. He's on the clock for the Winnipeg Jets. There you go, Craig. Fellow TSN employee, Jesse Pollock will love to hear that. Um, <laughs> I guess, yeah, Lucas, did you want to throw anything else at Craig before we wrap No, up? I like I like the Winnipeg pick, Craig. I really do. And I think that with this year um, – you know, if they can hold down home ice, um, they're going to have a good chance against Minnesota. Or if it ends up being Colorado that they have to play and have to go through, you know, that home ice might be a big advantage to them with the the Winnipeg whiteout, right, Craig, and that that big crowd yeah. there. Well, we talk about how your team's constructed too. They're big up the middle. They got skill. They got size. You know, there's the I I think they can benefit from a defenseman. The, mm. the, the, that can give them some some bulk and some range and some reach. I think they can benefit from from some of those the, the players I just talked about the Colorado the Cogliano type a, a Lequinen type you, you know a Nick Felino type like a Barbashev St Louis yeah, is like, about that the, the, those types of players yeah, yeah absolutely I think that those are the types of players you know Adam Lowry is 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 a, is a terrific third mm-hmm. line center. And you got Dubois, who's been a, who's been a beast this year. Mark Scheifele, who's played great. But this is a really good team. They're well coached. And when you have a goaltender like Connor Hellebuck, and and the, and the good coaching comes into play because they had these players before, but they were not well coached. 
It's as simple as that. Yeah. They were not well coached. Mm -hmm. And that's why they faded. And that's why they struggled. But now with Rick Bonus behind the bench, this is a team that, to me, has shown Kevin Shovel Day off. And keep in mind, I use the word belief. He believed in his team. He said, no, I'm not mad. I need to make the change in the coaching area. And he did. And now he sees that his team is really capable. Help strengthen the team. That's why Kevin's that's why Kevin's on the clock. And 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 I think these opportunities with a with a team that to me I see is legitimate, you have to take advantage. You have to take advantage. Yeah, and I think there's a pretty good argument to be had, Craig, that Josh Morrissey is the guy that benefited the most from that because what an electric year he's having. Um yeah, well, just... he did, but think about think about Rick Bonus. Think about yeah. the defenseman he had in Dallas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Merrill Haskinen, John Klingberg, Klingberg. Essel Lindell. Mm -hmm. You know, he had Ryan Suter last year. You know, you, you just go back, Jamie Alexiak, when they went to the you just go back and look at what Rick has done. And you, you know, it's the same thing, you know, when you when you think about how coaching impacts the game. And and what Rick Bonus has allowed Josh Morrissey to do with his with his abundance of ability. Skating being his, his his foundation is that you know when, when when you're when you're always just pressure 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 chasing out of position when you're out of when you chase out of position you got to chase back to position well that, that now you're using your skating in the wrong way what Rick Bonus has done is directed Josh Morrissey and those other defensemen and the player we're using our skating in a positive manner yeah Daryl Sutter did it with Oliver Shillington he told Oliver. Oliver, you've always used your skating to make up for mistakes. But when you take a stride in the wrong direction, that means it's two strides to make up for that wrong one. And two strides in the NHL is, is way too much. Yeah. Coaching. Coaching, coaching, coaching. Don't underestimate it. There you go, Craig. Uh, thank you again so much for coming on. On the way out here, Craig, I wanted to ask if you have any, whether it's personal projects or things you got going on, whether it's TSN, scouting, anything you're excited about coming up that you want to give a shout out? Well, I mean, we're like, I mean, really our focus now is, is on the, uh, is on the deadline, right? I mean, yeah. you, you know, you're, I, I think at this point in time, you, you know, you've watched the prospect pool and, and you're really comfortable. I, I, I said before that, you know, going and watching Quentin, you know, play after coming back from his injuries, really. I'm not worried about what my list looks like in November or January or March. I'm, I'm trying to get it as like, I'm trying to get really comfortable with it. So when it comes out in June, the final list that I can be really confident yeah. in what I'm in, in what I'm putting out there. It's never going to be exact. You're, you're trying to get the ranges, right? Well, that requires getting into the rinks and watching the players. So that's what I'm doing. That, you know, that's where I get a lot more focus at this time of the year. After the trade deadline, I got a lot more focus on that because, you know, that, that's that, that's where you're at. So, you know, March 3rd comes and goes for the NHL teams. Well, it goes for me in a little bit of a different direction, you know, where you're really zeroing in on at, at, at critical points of the season. You know, it's playoffs. Down the stretch, teams trying to make the playoffs internationally. You have the U18 championships. So that's where I really uh, get going in terms of, uh, you know, really trying to work the process and the work that I've done over the course of the last 18 months, really try to, you know, proverbial finishing touches on it come June. There you go, Craig. As always, doing great work. Uh, we love what you're doing. And, uh, of course, we really appreciate you coming on because we know you have a TV appearance coming up. So uh, <laughs> thank you for making the time and, and hopping on, Craig. Thanks a lot, Craig. Yeah, John, yeah, Jonathan, yeah you're welcome. Thanks for reaching out. Yeah, I was uh, always happy to participate and uh, stay in touch. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Craig. What a legendary chat with Craig Button. And now coming up, we're going to chat with David Alter and get some Leafs talk going. Uh, we'll talk a little bit of the Eastern Conference. So, Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't yet, go follow on Spotify and Apple, the Hot Take Hockey podcast on Spotify and Apple. We appreciate the support there as well as here on YouTube. And let's go to the chat with David Alter. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Hot Take Hockey podcast. Myself, John, with Lucas and a legendary guest, another legend on the pod. We got David Alter. Uh, you can find his writing on uh, SI.com. And also he's got the podcast. He's got uh, you're with uh, Rob Wong, right? And Paul Hendrick. We just and, recorded and a new Hendrick. episode uh, earlier this afternoon as well. So there you go. they rotate between the two. But yeah, oh, there you go. Anyone so, who's anyone knows who Paul Hendrick is. Of course. Henny tweets. Oh, beauty. Henny yeah. tweets. Make sure you guys yeah. go follow the Rinkwide uh, Toronto podcast. 
Uh, but David, man, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I don't know if I should take it as a compliment or I feel like I'm getting old if I'm being called a legend. I don't even know. It's just, <laughs> it's not, I've never been referred as to legendary anything. So uh, thank you for that. But uh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, of course. Uh, we're always seeing your Leaf stuff on Twitter. Uh, love reading your stuff. Uh, so for you right now, what's your day to day or week to week looking like? Uh, heading into the trade deadline, obviously the Leafs um, versus maybe all of us <laughs> growing up uh, not being so hot. But the Leafs, great team right now, great regular season team. Uh, how has it been covering the Leafs your day to day and all that leading into the trade deadline playoffs? Yeah, well, I mean, this year has been great just because we've been back in the room. Like the last two years prior to that. Uh, we would only see players through news conferences and before that zoom. Yeah. So that was kind of tough. And that was actually that 21 season, all Canadian division was my first year back on the beat after being away for about two to three years. So um, it, this year was just great to just put some face time in after a long yeah. period of time. And in, in that chunk of years, the, the team just changes so much. So to be able to do that, uh, to establish rapport with the players is a lot of fun. Um, the challenge this year, really, though, is after the opportunities missed of the previous two seasons, and now we're at the All-Star break, and it's looking like the playoff spots are virtually locked in. Yeah. Now the story becomes, okay, outside of trade deadline, what's the what's the interesting point at this point between now and and the playoffs everyone's just waiting for that narrative that let's get the playoffs going kind of mentality and the Leafs don't have a lot to play for it was kind of disappointing in that last game against Boston that they didn't have a better showing because at least if they would have got that to nine points instead of being back by 13 maybe you can think okay maybe now it's in single digits you know one team is going on an uptrend Boston that would have been four straight losses if they lost that game Maybe you can sandwich the gap there, but uh, Boston showed why they were the class of the league. And and so now it's just kind of talking, phoning around and seeing what the Leafs may or may not do and combing through the salary cap and their injury situation and seeing what could be possible, what they may want to address and, and the arms race around them and the LTI space that other teams have around them and what they might do and mm -hmm. how they would have to try and keep up. You know, the asking price has been established in Bo Horvat for those type of players. And so now it's really going to be a matter of what do Leafs feel they need to do? What are the teams around them doing? Can they keep up and can they push through and really be the different team that they keep saying that they are than compared to last year? Every year, that, David. Every defensive year. Identity. <laughs> <laughs> defensive yeah. identity. That's the big thing they've been saying this year that's different. For the most part, that's yeah. been true. There have been lapses recently, but for the most part, they have been a better defensive team. Yeah, absolutely. For the most part, I feel like the Leafs, um, the last few seasons, are a very underrated defensive team. Um, and and that's shown with with the improvement, with the different personnel they brought in and just, you know, shoring up in, in their own end. Um, you know, David, I wanted to – you alluded to it in terms of the Leafs are playing Tampa. I mean, it's almost just for sure at this point, right? Yeah. I feel like – I'd like to get a percentage on that, but it is pretty much, you know, wrapped up. Leafs and Lightning. It's just a matter of who who we starting at. Are we starting at Amelie? Are we starting at Scotia Bank? Right. Um, let's move. Let's start on defense. Uh, do you see the Leafs and Kyle Dubas looking at uh, defensive ads? And is it a more significant ad? More of a depth ad? Um, I know one position is going to affect how you address another. But how do you see the Leafs approaching the deadline when it comes to their defensive core? I think it's going to be a depth ad. Certainly, uh, a, a piece that could be slightly better than the five six but plays the five six mm -hmm. um a lot of it's going to come down to chemistry like i actually do think right now outside of jake muzzin which we'll get clarity on later at the end of the month that the six guys that they have right now is the optimal look like there's really not much of a debate that since tj brody has been back it stabilized morgan riley in that defense yeah. pair they like jordano with hall and then they like Sandine with Lilligren. And then really it's just a matter of if you add someone, are you adding someone because they're going to be a better player? Or are you adding someone out of insurance that could play the increased minutes should 
one of those guys get hurt. And because of the way they played with all those man games lost, plus some of the other guys that they do have that have been good for them, uh, found gems and Connor Timmins to some degree and Jordy Ben for the physical presence, if they need to insert that, that I don't think they really need to swing for the fences for someone big in that regard. Um, uh, you do want to have the depth. That's yeah. going to be something that they do look to. But I think in terms of the big pieces that they do in terms of what will cost the most, mm -hmm. it's probably going to be somewhere in that top six. Cause you know, for the most part, they can be okay, but to bank on bunting and yarn croak together, not having any sort of slip or, or, or drop off between now and the end of the season one or the other, plus other injuries that may come is probably not how you want to look at your top six right now. So getting a bona fide left winger who can play with the core four players, I think is probably going to be their most expensive acquisition between now and March 3rd. Yeah. I think the easy gaps are definitely up front. Uh, I was also going to say to you, cause yeah, it's, it's a big debate because do they upgrade defense significantly or if they go for that depth ad, like, you just listed it. They have eight caliber or NHL caliber defensemen right now. So it's like, you add another depth guy, you have nine. Um, I do think with Sandy and Lilligren, that's the case of like, I love watching them play. Like I test it. And obviously there's a lot of stats to, to back it up, but uh, even the chemistry, like the chemistry for those two guys has been huge. But um, going back to that Boston game, I wonder if that's the conversation, like, okay, they look great. They've looked great in the season, but when it comes to the Tampa Bay's and the Boston's of the world, can those two guys together, handle that load especially if they get a bad matchup and Pasternak Marshawn Bergeron comes over the bench then is that a different conversation with Sandin and Lilligren on the ice together yeah well and the other thing too is remember Rasmus Sandin didn't play in the playoffs last year because yeah. he had that injury even though he was healthy enough and Lilligren was benched after game two exactly mm -hmm. so so um putting them together for what will be a redemption and previous lack of playoff experience could be pretty dicey that may be getting a depth playoff experience defenseman to be in there just in case. I mean, Jordy yeah. Ben's got playoff experience. Uh, so there is that element to it as well. Uh, Connor Timmons does not. So that's really why you want to grab another depth defenseman. Have you been on the... Know, Sorry, keep going. We all know that right now, the, the game that they're playing right now compared to what the game's going to be in the playoffs it's going to be very different. Like that's just the truth of it. And so uh, as well as you can prepare between now and then the stresses of it aren't going to be tested until the first couple of games. And if the change has to be made to Sandy Lilligren and they don't address it, what are you doing? Like it's, it's kind of difficult to address. I was going to say leash Twitter has always been talking about Luke Shen. Have you been on that train? I haven't, but Henny has Henny brings <laughs> it up uh, a lot on the rink wide Toronto podcast. Um, it makes sense. You know, it's really funny in the, in the, since 2007, when I first started covering the Leafs, even as a general Toronto assignment reporter, I can't recall a situation of a player who's ever left that didn't leave because he was beloved, but left because he didn't live up to the expectations. I have never seen that situation where the player comes back as a different person and it could work. I think it could in Luke Shen's case, because yeah. so much has happened there that I don't think a lot would be asked of him. Um, and, and the regime and who's there compared to when he started is totally different. Like it's a complete about face uh, in terms of who's there. But uh, aside from that, uh, I just, I don't, I've never seen it. Like I remember even looking at goaltender options in the off season and seeing like James, yeah, seeing James Reimer being thrown yeah. around as a potential tandem, I'm like, yeah, okay, like I'd like it, but like that hasn't happened, and I don't know if we're ready for it. As well, everyone's been talking about like, JVR right now, <laughs> right? Yeah, like that's another one, <laughs> right? Like so, so like all these things, I don't know. Like you, you, like I just don't see it anywhere else in the league where that's happened and it's worked. So, yeah. so like that's. Not saying it can't work in the Leafs if if this regime has done anything, it's they've gone against the grain and 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 uh, have pulled off the unexpected to do things that are unique and and can pull off things sometimes. But I just don't know if that works for them. And so 
Luke Shen, I think, would be a great add. He's definitely got the playoff experience down pat now in that 5-6 yeah. role with Tampa. So it would make sense in that regard. Um, yeah, it, it's – like, he would be the most likely – uh, in that regard. Um, but it, I guess it would just depend on cost. If, if the cost is anything beyond a fourth rounder, I don't know if they do it. So, yeah. Um, you know, and the other, then, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the other thing is too, David, it's like, you got to, um, you know, we know it's Toronto and Tampa and you, for the Leafs, you always want to be guarding yourself and, and trying to get ahead of Tampa in terms yeah. of moves that they want to make. <laughs> I know. Where and Tampa wants yeah. Luke Shen. Like yeah. Tampa and Boston wants Luke Shen. Luke Shen. Everyone wants, Boston Shen. wants Luke Shen. <laughs> So it's almost like blocking blocking that sort of deal. But I, I agree with what you were saying earlier, John, where it seems interesting to me that they would want to bring in, you know, another depth guy when they already have eight, because now you're at 90, as opposed, you know, maybe that does make some sense if they use one of their defensive chips in a forward trade, like Sandine's going out the door in a forward deal, right? Um, then you would need to fill the gap. Um, but, but as far as the depth D that are out there on the market, like once you get past Jake McCabe and, and Gavrikov, like, like the bigger pieces, who's, yeah. who's really out there? Like Edmondson, um, is, is a guy that I know is out there and maybe Lost like, the Chikorin trade finally Nicola. drops. <laughs> oh, yeah. right. Chikorin's at the top, obviously that yeah, list, yeah. but there's not too many guys that, that, that look that I look at and I think are better than what they have at all. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, like the, this is the real thing. And the other thing too, is, I mean, you brought up a good point when when it comes to who the Leafs might have to acquire and stuff, and they're at 49 to 50 contracts. So they have a slot for one, and then it's going to probably come at a prospect and, you know, maybe a three-for-one like that where you have a, a, a Bo Horvat type situation that kind of clears the deck where mm -hmm. a roster player has to go in order to either make the space. And in the Leafs' case, it's, I don't even think it's cap space. It's just going to be roster space. Yeah, for sure. And so you kind of have to open up the decks of the prospects. And, you know, you see Matthew Nyes kind of get tossed around a lot there. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, it's... I was going to ask be, you there. Are you are you a yeah. yes or no for trading Matt Nyes? I, I, I'm, an, I'm a yes if it makes sense. Like, I don't think any prospect the Leafs have right now is untouchable. Like, I really don't. Like if it's when you look back to it, I don't know. Now I, I might be wrong. I'm a little older and I go back to what happened last year when the Leafs lost to Tampa and how okay the sentiment was among Leaf fans that that happened. I was surprised mm -hmm. just because I, I thought was surprised too. Yeah. I, I thought 2020 was such an opportunity missed with how easy that path was to the conference finals or whatever you call it in that year, because yep. they didn't have conferences. But yeah. um, but uh, to have that route to the Final Four and have no excuse, and you load up, and that was the final result, that I just don't see how you can approach other years with the divisional opponents that you have that you don't kind of lean into it and try and push forward. Now, maybe they're seeing what Boston is right now, and it may not be worth mortgaging the future for what looks like a juggernaut in that division. But then at the same time, do the Leafs have appetite for a first or second round exit? I don't know. Um, it's tough. It's a real tough one. I don't think Kyle Dubas is going to mortgage the future and go all in and give up stuff. But the Leafs have got to do something here because they're in this cycle right now where Tampa is what they are. Boston's what they are and there doesn't seem to be any letting up in that and I think you really have to try and push through with some sort of big acquisition that feels like it's going to be the difference maker so David how about you give us three of those potential acquisitions that you like um that fit with the Leafs um you know yeah let, let's hear your top three I'll make oh. it tough I'll, I'll make it tougher on you David Exclude the obvious like big names that Leaf fans dream of, of like the Kane or Myers of the world. Three names that you think like are actually realistic based on what. Uh, here, I'll, I'll even I'll even kick off and give you one. Okay, I'll give you my fit my personal favorite right now. I've been talked into it the last few days. I am all aboard the Barbashev train. I think this guy can slide into that top six if he needs to. But in a perfect world, he's on the third line the entire you know rest of the season and into the playoffs. 
I saw how physical and tenacious he was in the run with the blues. And I mean, even to this day, how he's, how important of a player he is for St. Louis. I really like Barbashev, um, for, for the Leafs. I think yeah, it to me, the, exactly what they the Barbashev one's like the similar conversation as the Shen. It really depends on the price. Like I'm not giving up yeah. more than a, like a second or third to me is already pushing it for a Barbashev yeah. type. So, right. So here's what I'll say. I'm going to give you a list, but they're not realistic, right? Like okay. I like okay. them all for different reasons. Dream yeah. world, dream world um, scenarios. <laughs> I actually think the Leafs would be best suited if they could get them on the cheap with retention and everything, getting a Jonathan Taves. Oh, I like it. And, and the reason why, and you're seeing it now with the whether Austin Matthews hurt, if something happens to their center depth right now, like I haven't liked David Camp's game in the last week and a bit. Um, and Pontus Holmberg's too new to really think like he's your solution. And I look at previous Stanley Cup teams and they just have great third line centers. And I just... I look at the team's depth in the center position right now and don't feel as good about it with Kerfoot's game dropping off uh, with now Camp kind of struggling a little bit. Yeah. Um, even though Tavares has improved, you know, say the other guys do improve and you want to try and load up, you can move Tavares on the wing for a few shifts. If you feel like you got to move Taves up in certain situations, mm -hmm. I think there's just a lot more afforded flexibility and from a cost of doing it, I I, I like it, it. It brings it hits all the it hits all the marks. It's uh, center depth. It helps your wing depth too. the The situation is such where Toronto and Chicago can probably be a good enough trade partner where it yeah. probably wouldn't cost them a lot as a rental, uh, provided you have the right trade partners down there, and it it would actually motivate everybody around because of the caliber of the player that they're getting. And so, David, there I, can't be a scenario where Kerfoot's ever the second line setter again in the playoffs ever. Well, probably <laughs> not, but look, I mean, look, he was the first line left winger for the game one. Yeah. Yeah. Like that was the other thing too. Like I, I, I do think you didn't see the healthiest of Michael Buntings. He kind of commit, he kind of admitted that when yeah. we talked to him in September at the least charity golf tournament, that he played, mm -hmm. like, if it wasn't the playoffs, he wouldn't have been playing. But I think you need the, uh, you, you need those type of characters in the playoffs more than anything else, right? And um, I don't think he was able to be the same type of player, even though he performed well offensively. I don't know if he was able to kind of go to the net, be under the skin to the same level that he had been before. Anyway, so, so he's, so Jonathan Taves is someone I like. I that like reason. that one. I like that one a lot. Um, Timo Meyer makes sense only because while people look at it as an RFA, he's not a real RFA because he's not a $10 million player. Yeah. Like, like the qualifying offer is going to turn a lot of people off, I think. Um, and the Leafs could be in one of those situations where depending on the assets, they can either try to negotiate to keep him or just let him walk away and treat it like a, UFA acquisition like a lot of people could but at the same time maybe sign and trade or or figure out if he's a part of that process too to kind of help in their top six so there's that and um, that one and that one David that's Matthew Nyes that's probably the first round pick mm, or Matthew yeah. Nyes in a sec it, it's it's a steep price that one for sure yeah yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's that. The Jake Jake McCabe one makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense too. So, like, I just uh, I don't want them to give up a first for a McCabe. I just I I feel like I'm gonna get some PTSD stuff going here if they trade a first for a guy that just doesn't scream impact. And I think that's why they're protecting the asset more. But I just, yeah, I don't well, I mean, but first. that's it. Like, it's just the it's the term left, right? Yeah. Like, I think you've got to look at what the Leafs did in 2019. And kind of go a little bit on that playbook because what the what Kyle Dubas kind of had to do post COVID was a lot to do with the cap. You couldn't really commit to guys and you kind of had to be creative that way. Now things are starting to open up a bit. You're hearing Gary Bettman say that they're approaching six billion in revenue. So that's already putting the feeder in that 
there might be four and a half million in cap space to work with next year. And so if you can lock in guys on existing deals already, that's going to be even more powerful for the guys that you can retain, um, that you don't have to pay a new inflation cost for a person. So, so like there, there is a reason or a case to be made to at least get rid of a protected first round pick in that regard. So um, that would be like my wish list. What I think they'll do, I don't know. I mean, Ryan O'Reilly kind of fits the mold of, of similar to Taves, did, like about what they did in twenty twenty or twenty one. Yeah. So yeah. in terms of just trying to get someone who can play in that spot, knows he's not going to be there for long, has a Stanley Cup caliber a pedigree. Um, look, Taves and and Taves and uh, Ryan O'Reilly fit that quota of. Of yeah. acquiring an existing captain at the deadline. As well, I was well. going to say, do you think Dubas could look at? <laughs> yeah. Do you think Dubas could look at last year, like what he did, kind of with Giordano, um, yeah. Blackwell? Like, I know people have talked about like the Laverty McCabe, or I've seen other people talk about Tanner Janot and Ekholm. So, I mean, you can go down the list. I, I feel like Dubas will make one move that will surprise us. Maybe one that's expected, but I think it, one's going to come out of, and, and it might not necessarily even be big. I think it's just going to be one name that we just haven't talked about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's possible, but I think the main thing is going to be we don't know what their LTI situation is going to be between now and March 3rd, which is what's making it so wide open in terms of the possibilities of what they could do. Um, they could go the 2021 route or do what Vegas is doing now, is if they have guys on LTI, spend that on LTI and worry about activating later on yeah. um, and and try to match that way. In, in order to add pieces because now the secrets about double retention and bringing cap down, those are used by everybody now. Like there's not a lot of tools in the CBA left. Yeah. Not saying they can't surprise us, but digging through the math, there isn't a lot out there that's going to be unique. Mm-hmm. All right, David, how do you feel about the goaltending as well? Like, I know it, it's one of those ones that's a bit of a hot topic. I know a lot of Leaf fans were warming up to Samson off a lot, and the team has sort of been in, you know, win two, lose one, sort of their form lately. Um, and with Joseph Wall, this is a long shot, but Joseph Wall pushing in the Marlies. Um, what what are your thoughts on, on the different options they could have in goal um, come playoff time? We actually discussed this on the podcast today about if they need to do anything there. Yep. Uh, um, probably don't have to. Like, I uh, do they need like another like a Riddick or someone if they have space or or whatever to kind of uh, bolster that position in case something happens and you need someone else. I do think that the Leafs have been really impressed with how Joseph Wall has got his game going this year after being injured for so long and. I, I had a conversation with him recently about all the meditation and stuff that he's been doing to just kind of stay in the moment. And um, he just looks really dialed right now. You could even see it in the all-star game. Um, the yeah. HL star clips that are out there, just phenomenal the way, the way he was kind of handling that three on none. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, like I, I like Ilya Samsonov's game. I like how he's, he seems to bounce back pretty quickly this is the craziest workload that he's just had never before. I think he's had five games in 10 days uh, with the Capitals in the previous year a couple times, but nothing like the seven games in 15 that he just went through, plus eight appearances total, if you want to include uh, the 40 minutes that he played in place of uh, Matt Murray. Um, if Matt Murray is still hurt from an ankle injury, I'm very curious to see how Wall does coming up. But Shalgren's been a been okay band aid, but certainly not the number one option you want to go in terms of the depth. But as a number four, I think it would work for them. So I don't think they need to do anything right now. Even if Matt Murray struggles between now and the playoffs, I think the whole purpose of having Matt Murray is so if someone like a Samsonov or, or anyone else uh, does struggle after games one and two, you can push the playoff experience button in, in that adrenaline fueled moment yeah. come out as the hero. So I think that that's kind of what this was all about when they acquired someone like that with a little bit of term that they've got a couple of good goalies that, that they just hope that one rises to the occasion at a moment in time. And for the most part, they were either good at the same time, struggling at the same time or hurt at the same time. But now there's been a separation, which is actually what they wanted because then they can just allow you know, the other person to just kind of work their way back 
if the other one struggles. So for now, it's okay, but you do want to see some stability heading into the playoffs in that position for sure. Yeah, 100%. You always need that net minder to go for the run. So, David, man, thank you so much for coming on the pod. Uh, just on our way out here, give yourself a shout for your writing, your your pod, anything you got going on, give it a shout. Yeah, check out uh, Inside the Maple Leafs at SI.com. Easy enough to Google. You'll find that there. Uh, my hand, Twitter handles the altar. My TikTok is David Alter 35. That thing's been growing. I've been reviewing a lot of the media meals around okay. the league uh, nice. on that thing and uh, other things you see at the rink that you just wouldn't see during TV timeouts. So give that a follow and the rink wide Toronto podcast with myself, Rob Wong and Paul Hendrick, the only post game show podcast with a reporter in the building for all 82 games. Let's go. That's nice. a W. Let's Thanks, go. David. Really appreciate right. that. Thanks for coming on the pod. And yeah. Appreciate appreciate you having me on, guys. Thank you. Lucas, what a W, man. What a pod app. We're on our way to just a quarter of a Hana and 24 episodes. And Craig Button and David Alter in one episode. What a banger. The Brian McCabe episode was a beauty, buddy. Holy. Two yeah. great guests. Uh, great conversation. I mean unbelievable having them both on and, and we'll keep in touch with both of them for sure uh maybe you'll see them back on future epis who knows yeah and for everyone as i said if you're a listener you're watching on youtube uh yeah go check out spotify go check out apple hot to cocky podcast luke's is helping out uh with that i'm i obviously post on youtube but uh yeah lucas man co-hosting's been fun with you and we're gonna keep her going so if you have any suggestions for guests guys honestly just reach out Drop a comment, reach out to either of us on social media. It could be anyone. If you, hey, if you have a, we'll just put it out there. If you have a connect with someone dope that you want to like throw their name out there and have us chat with them, like, let me know. Let, let us know. know. Let yeah, us know. So, so um, yeah, we also, um, we also are going to have a couple episodes here and there, obviously leading to the trade deadline where we focus on trade stuff and maybe it's just Lucas and I, but always love good guests. So Lucas, anything else before we head out? We got lots of uh, good content coming soon, John. Yeah. Uh, as we as we march towards the trade deadline, there's going to be lots of uh, other surprises. Uh, so I'll just I'll just leave that there and tease that out. But looking forward to creating content with you and keeping going, John. Episode 25 is up next, and yeah. before you know it, we're we're now a quarter way to 100. Oh yeah. So thank you from Lucas and myself, John. Thank you so much for listening. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple or watch it on YouTube, we really appreciate it. Make sure you hit that subscribe, like, rate, heavy follow do all that good stuff on the pods on the audios and uh yeah we'll chat soon guys have a great one thanks to craig button and david alter and we'll see you soon peace, peace.